Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. I'm Vicki Colvin, and we're in week two. What I'm going to be talking about today, very briefly, is mass spectroscopy. And it's a bit of a departure in atomic spectroscopy, because rather than talking about the interaction of light with atoms, we're going to be talking about measuring the mass of atoms. And it's a powerful tool and one that is really important to have in your arsenal of atomic spectroscopies. So in mass spectroscopy, what you're doing is you're measuring the mass of an atom. So it's a very different instrument in many ways from ICP OES or ICP or rather flame AAS because you don't actually detect the light, you detect mass, but the front end of the instrument, you suck sample into something that excites it is actually similar and in fact it's really similar to ICP OES because what you have to do is you have to get atoms really excited as we'll talk about in a second. And so in atomic mass spectrometry or ICP MS you're measuring mass. You're going to be able to go to a lot slower detection limits and you're going to be able to measure the isotopes of atoms both of which are powerful things to be able to do. So let's talk about what an ICP MS has to do. First of all you have to atomize your sample and create a dense gas, just like you do in atomic absorption spectroscopy and atomic emission spectroscopy. And that's where you have a nebulizer, sometimes you have a spray chamber. These are both tools that you use to kind of go from the liquid phase to the gas phase. Now, you also use an ICP torch in mass spectrometry, so it's very similar to ICP AES, which I talked about in the last lecture. The difference here is that you want those atoms to be ionized because Mass spectrometry relies on the detection of the charge to mass ratio. So it's super important that you actually fully ionize the, your sample when it goes through the torch. One of the most amazing things to me about ICPMS is what you have to do to get it into the mass spectrometer. Because you've got a torch, it's at high pressure, you've basically got a high pressure liquid phase sample that you've vaporized, and you have to get that stuff into a mass spectrometer, which because it's detecting ions, can't have any air molecules in it. It's pumped out to very, very low pressures. And you have to have a lot of differential pumping. It's kind of like you're shooting a fire hose of water into outer space and you don't want the pressure to change. So it's a real trick and it's got some really cool technology in the pumping systems. So there's a lot of skimmers, a lot of differential pumping involved, and you can read more about that. Now before I go through some of the most important components, um, I just want to remind you that I'm really counting on this week that you would do your reading because your reading is going to have all of the little details that I don't want to go through in these lectures because it's kind of boring to sound like an encyclopedia, but I do want to pull over one of your reading materials and just kind of introduce you to what I think is important about it. So here's the reading material you'll be looking at for ICPMS. It's 30 minutes and it's something put up by Perkin Elmer. And it basically goes over a lot of the details. Um, you can read all about how skimmers work. This is really important in order to do the differential pumping. Um, you can learn about what you have to do in order to purify the ions that are entering because you don't want a lot of neutrals mucking about in your really, really good mass spectrometer. Um, one of the most important discussions I want you to focus on is interferences. And so in interferences, you think you have an atom present, let's say lead or sorry, iron 56. But in point of fact, you could have argon oxygen, which has the same mass ratio or same mass as iron 56. So this is an interference that you can get in ICPMS. And you need to use reactive cells and other kinds of techniques in order to get rid of some of these common interferences. And this has a really nice discussion of it. So please take a look. Meanwhile, back to lecture. So the most important piece of this whole instrument is the quadrupole. You're going to hear quadrupole mass spectroscopy cried a lot, and I would do mass spectroscopy in the second part of this class in a lot more detail. Here we're just really hitting the surface for the point of view of doing atomic mass spectroscopy in an elemental kind of analysis problem. But the quadrupole is a really nifty device because what it's able to do is separate mass. And here's how it does it. What it does, shown here, are basically atoms and they've been ionized, so the ICP torch has done its job of stripping um, and making ions out of the sample. And a quadrupole is applying basically a magnetic field, and it's doing in a, using a quadrupole rather than a dipole, so it's got four poles to it. And in a quadrupole filter, you can manipulate that magnetic field by changing the polarity of the two different poles, so you sort of tune it one way or another. And what happens inside of these magnetic fields is ions will actually move in a pattern kind of shown here. You can think of it as an oscillating 
kind of pattern. Sort of they're racing down the quadrupole. And at a particular tuning of the quadrupole, a particular magnetic field strength, one ion will make it all the way through. It will have an extremely straight path down the quadrupole. But if the ion's charge to mass ratio is just a little bit different, it's actually going to deflect and it's going to end up leaving the quadrupole. So when you do a mass spectroscopy experiment, what you're doing is you're sweeping the quadrupole such that you are selecting one mass over another. In fact, it's often called a mass filter for that reason. And so down at this end over to the right, what you'll have is some sort of detector. Uh, it's pretty simple. The detectors, they usually just produce a current because ions are slamming in, so ions are relatively easy to detect. And the really guts of this instrument is in this filter that is allowing you to select only one mass. And sometimes if you want higher resolution, you want better selection because you can maybe imagine iron 56 and iron 57 would basically come down at the same time and you couldn't really separate them. Then you put two quadrupoles end to end. And then you have a lot longer path length and a lot more oscillations so that one that's not quite the right mass will be deflected and won't make it all the way to the detector. So one of the things that allows you to do when you get that high mass resolution, uh, resolution is to do a really amazing set of experiments that are based on the ability to distinguish and differentiate isotopes in samples. So we've been talking about a lot about detecting atoms, but what if you could distinguish carbon-12 from carbon-13? That's a really important kind of measurement. It's actually how we do carbon dating. So Remember, isotopes are going to be the same number of protons, but they're going to have different numbers of neutrons. And some of those isotopes will be what's called stable isotopes, meaning they're not radioactive. But they may change and behave in different ways than the primary isotope does. And that's the basis for looking at the ratios between isotopes and samples. Probably the two fields that use this the most, most in science right now would be in geology. It's used to do what's called geochronology. You can get a sample, look at these isotope ratios, and deduce a lot about how old it is and where it might have come from deep in the Earth. So if you want to look into that more, feel free. I couldn't find any really good PDFs on it that weren't um, copyright controlled, but I give you a couple of hints here if you want to go after that. And this is something very unique to mass spectrometry. You couldn't get isotopic analysis out of ICP atomic emission because the difference in the number of neutrons really doesn't have a huge impact on the energy levels of those electrons until you get to the really heavy elements, and, and then it's even a subtle difference. So watch my demo for ICP-MS, and thanks so much for joining me. I'll see you next time.